In today's episode, let's talk a little bit more about autophagy, this intracellular cleanup process, and review two recently published review articles that I thought are pretty fascinating. They have some great images, especially for those of you that are new to understanding sort of, hey, what is this process of autophagy? How can I increase it? How can I measure whether or not I need to support autophagy? And how can I assess whether or not what I'm doing is actually inducing or increasing autophagy in my body? These are common questions. The most qu common question that, that I've seen on the internet, especially in the last sort of two years is, uh, how long do I need to fast in order to see appreciable increases in autophagy? So anyway, I would like to share those with you. Although we do have a full course over at courses.highintensityhealth.com that you can check out. But again, in today's video, it's just going to be just a, a quick breakdown. And if you want even more details, you can check that out. Uh, but, but these papers are just phenomenal and they keep coming out and the images are amazing. So it's worth diving into it, even if you've heard about autophagy before. So um, this paper right here, Autophagy and Major Human Diseases, this paper in the EMBO journal uh, has just a phenomenal image about how autophagy impacts brain and neurodegenerative related disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, ALS, and the, the heart, so the cardiovascular system from the endothelial cells to the heart to the lung, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, COPD, cystic fibrosis, various liver disorders, so from hepatocellular carcinoma to uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, uh, all of that there. Uh, the kidneys, really important as well. The reproductive system. So we think about fertility. We know, uh, unfortunately, infertility is on the rise. There's endometriosis and challenges within the uh, reproductive tissues. So those are uh, all part of, and, and tissues impacted by autophagy. The eyes, so age-related macular degeneration. Um, that is linked with changes and dysfunctions in autophagy. Cancer, uh, susceptibility to infections, both bacterial and viral autoimmune disorders. Uh, of course, we have the metabolic disorders, which I think are the conditions that are most sort of remedied by and uh, individuals with overweight or obesity, individuals that are insulin resistant, and individuals with fatty liver disease, I think can really benefit here. And again, we have uh, the musculoskeletal system, so bones and muscle are, are also... so. Essentially, we've named pretty much every single tissue and organ system in the body, right? So these are all impacted by this process of autophagy uh, because it's so important to cellular homeostasis. Now, let's first talk about sort of what it is and what regulates autophagy. So you have the brake pedal. This is known as mTOR, mechanistic target of rapamycin. This essentially causes growth and inhibits this process of this intracellular cleanup known as autophagy. So now the context here often gets lost on the internet where people say, think protein, mTOR, mTOR bad, therefore protein bad. It's We want mTOR expression to be transient, to ebb and flow. We don't want mTOR overexpression, right? You want glucose in your body, but you don't want hyperglycemia persistently, right? It's normal to have a little blip after you eat a meal and it will come down. That's normal with mTOR as well. So if you're snacking every you know, two hours, uh, snacking all the time, you know, you're sitting there having uh, chips and pop tarts and this and that, you know, uh, little cookies and chocolates at your, at your desk. And then at three o'clock, you go to have Starbucks and, uh, 40 grams of sugar and your Frappuccino you know, vanilla uh, chai latte, right? You can see how that can lead to a state of overnutrition and chronic mTOR overexpression, which would put the brakes on various autophagy related processes and key tissues in your body, such as the liver, such as the heart and the vasculature and so forth. And that over time, my friends, can lead to deleterious changes such as fatty liver disease, such as obesity, such as insulin resistance. So thinking about these molecular switches in context is really helpful. Now, if mTOR is the break on autophagy, the gas pedal on autophagy is known as AMPK. So this is this activated monophosphate protein kinase. So this is it. Both of these are enzymes. So they're not evil, inherently good or bad. We need to think about the context. So you stimulate the gas pedal to drive autophagy, particularly in your liver, your muscle, your heart, and your brain when you're in a low energy state. So this can be achieved through intermittent fasting. This can be achieved through calorie restriction. This can be achieved through exercise. So when it comes to the practical nuts and bolts of hey, how do I measure autophagy? How do I increase it? A lot of people automatically, they think about fasting. I must fast. But we also need to think about exercise. The way that you can increase AMPK and inhibit mTOR, whether you're doing weight training or cardio, is through exercise, okay? 
So um, that's that's one way to, to sort of beneficially affect this. Potentially sauna therapy has been shown to be helpful for autophagy, at least in animal model studies and things like that. And so this is why exercise, this is why walking, this is why eating, uh, being in a state of energy balance and not overeating and overindulging and having you know too much ultra processed refined foods that are hyper palatable and enrich in energy. All of that uh, is helpful and compressing your feeding window. Remember, one of the various human studies that was well uh, randomized and, and published and so forth in June of 2019 showed that just early time-restricted feeding reduced mTOR and increased a lot of the autophagy-related genes. So you don't need to necessarily totally restrict your calories or over-exercise or anything like that. So we're going to continue on and talk about how impaired autophagy can be indirectly measured. But I do want to let our new listeners know it's Mike Mutzel and you're tuning in to High Intensity Health Radio. I'm grateful that you're here. If you're on YouTube, you could do us a huge favor and do other health seekers like yourself a favor by leaving a comment below and hitting, hitting that like button. That just tells the YouTube algorithm that, hey, this video was helpful and it should show up in other people's feeds. If you're in iTunes, you can uh, share a little bit of feedback as a review. That goes a long way. Also, if you want to support your metabolic health, one of the natural products that I recommend when it comes to supporting the process of autophagy is known as berberine hydrochloride. Very effective. You can take this to kickstart your fast. You can take it with dinner. It stimulates AMPK, actually, which, as we just talked about, is a natural sort of intracellular kinase or enzyme that fosters and induces this process of autophagy. So you can save over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C.com. You can check out the berberine hydrochloride there, the autophagy enhancer bundle, and much more. And use the coupon code HIH15 to save. That's 15% off the autophagy enhancer bundle and berberine using the coupon code HIH15 at checkout. So please do that and uh, and support your metabolic health that way. So let's continue on to talk about the, the ways that you can measure autophagy and the ways and sort of figure out who should emphasize fasting more or who should emphasize exercise more uh, and some of these pro-autophagy sort of enhancing processes. Well, the way that I like to break this down is if, you, if you're overweight or you're obese, okay, you have without knowing, without looking into your cells with a microscope, there's a subset of autophagy known as lipophagy, uh, which is how you literally burn fat, how, how you take you know, uh, long, longer chains of fatty acids and split them up into uh, free fatty acids that can be directly combusted in your mitochondria. So if, you ha if you're overweight or obese, you might want to consider being more proactive about and more consistent about enhancing autophagy through different mechanisms, right? Intermittent fasting, through a low-carb ketogenic style diet, which would be a low insulin, a lower insulin, and less glucose uh, fluxes and things like that. Uh, you might also want to consider, of course, everyone should, exercise, combination of 150 minutes uh, total per week of cardio, and then at least two days per week of resistance training. I actually suggest it, uh, four days per week, but most people aren't quite there yet. So two days per week is is going to be kind of bare minimum to get some of the benefits. Now, when you exercise, again, what are you doing? You're increasing the gas pedal that's stimulating this process known as autophagy. That's important. So we talked about obesity. We talked about being overweight. What about your liver? A lot of people that have uh, challenges with overnutrition have what's known as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fatty liver. That's when these liver enzymes, the AST, the ALT, and the GGT start to increase. These can be measured directly by pretty much any commercial laboratory in the United States or throughout the world. It's, they're categorized on your blood work as a liver function test panel. AST, ALT, GGT. Ask for these. Recommend your doctor, your health professional, write these on your next blood work. Now, we know that fat starts to build up in the liver when we get into states of overnutrition. When we're eating too much, when we're under-exercising, when we're having these processed foods... And that is linked with, guess what? Suboptimal functioning of autophagy. So that's another way to look at this. And you want to look at your triglycerides and your liver enzymes together to, to get a really good idea. So that's a, a way to look at this. If you have any functional decline in your eyesight, in your brain, in your memory, you're starting to get high blood pressure, hypertension. Remember, these are the tissues that are really influenced by the process of autophagy. Um, so we know that yeah, insulin resistance, we know that fat cell formation, and we know that declines in muscle mass and muscle strength are, guess what, linked with impairments of autophagy signaling and uh, sarcopenia and all that, as is indicated right here uh, in, in this image that really tells the story well from this recent paper in the journal Nature. So those are ways to ascertain because, again, these are intracellular processes that you can't just go out and measure. 
right? You can't just go out and measure like, hey, my messenger RNA and tissue uh, of my liver, yeah, it's, it's not practical or feasible. So we have to use more sort of tangible, holistic ways of looking at this. So again, uh, the fat in the liver, the fat on your body, uh, the strength and the, the health of your muscle tissue and your glucose regulation are how we're going to triangulate to see if you should uh, support autophagy. So I'm getting all this information, friends, by the way, from this paper that I would highly recommend checking out. It's called Autophagy in Metabolic Disease and Aging. So the other thing that we need to focus in on, well, we talked about, okay, are your liver enzymes increased? Are your triglycerides increased? How is your body fat? How is your muscle strength? The other thing we need to figure out is your age. As you age, the sensitivity and the expression of these autophagy-related genes go down. And so uh, older people should consider intermittent fasting and exercise more as a lifestyle modality that can support the healthy aging response, more important than, say, children, right? Your teenager that's snacking all the time, although it's not necessarily a good habit to get into, do we need to worry about them causing cancer at 16? Not necessarily to the same extent that a six-year-old person going to Starbucks and having Pringles and this every two hours, right? These are different scenarios because these processes decline with age. So the authors go on to say, autophagy has an essential role in maintaining cellular homeostasis in response to intracellular stress. Remember, favorable stress or hormetic stress can be achieved by way of exercise, compressing your feeding window, and all of that. However, the efficiency of autophagy declines with age, and overnutrition can interfere with this autophagic process. So we have so many adults, unfortunately, who are overweight, who are insulin-resistant, who are under-exercised, and we now know that they're more susceptible to, uh, to pathogens, right? We've seen this on the news, individuals that are intubated and on ventilators and all of this. Well, it turns out, remember, part of what autophagy does is it helps to clean up cellular pathogens and cellular debris. So it helps to fight viruses and bacteria and so on. Uh, in fact, autophagy-related drugs and compounds that stimulate autophagy like metformin and rapamycin, um, there was one paper in Kaiser Permanente last year, uh, and it's been you know, talked about extensively, has been shown to be supportive and protective from severe disease of COVID-19. So I thought that was kind of interesting because we know that metformin has been used um, quite extensively when it comes to longevity and so forth, and that it was independently correlated more in women, which I thought was fascinating with reduction in severe disease. Uh, therefore, conditions such as sarcopenic obesity, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes that are characterized by metabolic derangement and intracellular stress also involve the accumulation of damaged cellular components. So you're overeating, you're overgrowing, and you're not burning enough of that fuel uh, and causing this hormetic stress. You start to accumulate cellular trash. And over time, you know, if you've ever not taken your trash out or you've been on vacation and you come back to your, your house or your apartment, you're like, whoa, what does that smell? If you accumulate trash in your house, your house stinks. Well, the same thing can happen inside your cells. If you're not breaking down these aggregated misfolded proteins, uh, these accumulations of fats and lipids, your cells become dysfunctional. And remember, this accumulation of crap or trash inside your cells, guess what that also does? That stimulates the process of cellular senescence. And those senescent cells start to talk and crosstalk with other cells and drag more cells into this senescent phenotype. And basically, you have aged tissues. You have... Your eyesight isn't as good. Your brain isn't functioning as good. Your, your muscle cell is, is losing tissue and function. You get weaker uh, and so forth. So autophagy is key uh, in supporting these processes with aging. So, you know, what's a, what is a, a sort of summary of the protocol look like? We've talked about this a million and one times, so I feel like I'm very repetitive here. Early time-restricted feeding. So a window, something like, you know, 12 to 6, 10 to 6, 10 to 7, something like that. I think earlier the better. Exercise. Pretty much, you got to exercise every day, friends. That can be walking. That can be moving around. But you got to move your body. You got to stimulate those muscles. When you move your muscles and you deplete your um, blood glucose and glycogen, you increase glucagon and you decrease insulin. That can stimulate the process of autophagy. So moving your muscles, especially in the fasted state, can be helpful. Not going to bed on a full stomach. So eating, giving your body sufficient time. So you're not going to bed having desserts and cookies and treats and all of that. Having that persistent high glucose is going to slow down and put the brakes on this autophagy process by increasing mTOR. Again, mTOR is not bad. It's mTOR in context. Uh, lifting weights, potentially looking at natural compounds like essential fats that have been shown to be helpful, berberine hydrochloride, 
spermidine in mushrooms. You know, we did a video about what to eat in a day. Spermidine can be very helpful. So those are just some things to consider that I would suggest. But uh, keeping it very practical, compressing your feeding window, not overeating and exercising are going to be the, the most effective time-tested ways uh, to support the autophagy process. So if you want more details, you can check out courses.highintensityhealth.com. We have the Autophagy Enhancer Masterclass. It goes into this in much more depth if you're interested. But I'm grateful that you're still here. Thank you for hitting that like button. If you want to check out the show notes and some of these images that we posted on YouTube, I think they're, they're helpful. Just to understand this, because out of any physiologic process that people talk about on the internet, the one that gets butchered the most is autophagy. People say it's, it's good. It's always good. It's always bad. You know, it, it's really much more nuanced and tissue specific than most people talk about. So I think it's important that we, that we you know, keep it, keep the discussion sort of practical uh, and, and realize that it's, it's hard to measure directly, uh, but we can use our liver enzymes, our triglyceride, our level of body mass, and our strength as proxies to triangulate to see if supporting autophagy with time-restricted feeding and exercise uh, is helpful. So have an awesome rest of your day, friends. Hopefully you found these images in this video helpful. We will catch you in a future podcast down the road. Bye now.